Welcome back to a very British space program. You find us flying over the surface of Venus still. Well, in reality, EOS 1 is still sending data back, but it's, it's long gone from there. But I suppose we should keep going. So this episode, we're going to have another attempt at a moon landing. Um, but first, we've got to get some money to pay for the moon landing, so we're going to do a commercial contract. It is the 15th of April, 1961, and we're sending up a weather satellite because we are British and we like the weather. It's very simple. Um, this craft has to go up to 100 kilometer orbit, and it needs to be in an inclination of about 95 to 100 degrees. Um, we're sending up our workhorse, the Red Princess 4C again, and it is just doing it. It's just, you know what, I could probably set up a script to do this, and I could walk away and get lunch, because it is becoming so consistent. The craft is, I was actually thinking that at some point I was going to have to replace it, and we do have another version coming, but uh, the, the 5 is on its way, but I don't think we're actually going to replace the 4C. I think the 4C will still have a place in the program, because, you know, it, it is able to launch those small satellites into near-Earth orbit, into the interesting inclinations. We've got two launch sites that can do it, and it does it easily, and it does it cheap, so we can get a lot of money for it. So... There we go, she, she puts her up there into the correct orbit, the RCS system, I've done the RCS again twice, anyway, correct orbit, let's go. So, what on earth is that? Yeah, it is the 11th of August 1961, it's been a while since we had a launch, it's from, from April to August, it's a long time for us, but it's a loud one, isn't it? And this is the second flight of the White Javelin 2B, you will see it has got some extra boosters on there. I will explain in a moment, but flying the White Javelin 2B is a new pilot for us. This is, we've not put Matthew in or anything like that. Uh, we resisted the urge of using one of our veterans. We have brought in a new astronaut, and this is Jane Marsh. Jane Marsh, born and bred in Britain. Um, she might have a Canadian parent, we don't want to talk about that. Um, but she is flying the second flight of the Javelin 2B Victoria, um, partly because, um, we actually penciled it in for Rodney to do, but Rodney, uh, Rodney's retired, um, unfortunately. Uh, we feel he's probably been poached by the Americans. They have, uh, they've got, obviously got eyes on our technology and they want to know what's going on. So we think they may have poached him. Anyway, in reality, due to the KSP RP1 settings, we can't actually relaunch a shuttle from the, the launch pad until we get shuttle materials, which I don't think is particularly accurate, given the fact that we're basically a space shuttle program sort of organization so yeah um we're going to probably fiddle with that but because of that we had to launch it from the, the runway um the runway interestingly allows us to do that because our craft is just short enough to fit in with that so this craft spends about you know it spends almost a day in orbit which is its aim its aim was to spend um 18 hours in orbit with a periaps of about 170 kilometers she manages that perfectly however um Oh yeah, I must say we have extra boosters because the red bit on the back is actually extra life support and extra batteries and it's heavier than you would expect it actually ate into us but because we we're on the runway we could fit extra boosters, brilliant. Since our last launch the USA and the USSR have been very busy though. So Alan Shepard on the 5th of May piloted the USA's first suborbital flight and returned in person alive which was, uh, which was wonderful for them, um, very nice of them to do that. Um, and the USA, USSR Venera 1 actually passed um, Venus just after our EOS 1 craft. We got there first. Um, unfortunately, they've been unable to provide any images or data of their craft going past. And they, they claim it's happened, but we, we pointed, we, we sent them some of ours just so they could compare it with anything they might find, just in case they were wondering what data from Venus would actually look like. Um, and uh, just five days before the launch you're watching now, uh, Mr. Titov went into orbit for the... Uh, for the USSR and well he was there for 24 hours which is I'm going to be honest with you a little concerning for us um, but uh, we, we're fine we we, 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 we were the first there and we have a plane um, which we're bringing back down of orbit right now and the aim here is to first of all we get rid of our red canisters that's our life some extra life support and extra batteries we don't need those we're coming down we don't want to affect the, the shape of the plane we know it might actually be a problem um, so uh, Jane is actually going to just bring this through, and the aim is to land it near near the Canadian sort of Atlantic coast. Um, anywhere in the North Atlantic would be nice for us because the the Royal Navy is there, the Canadian Navy is there, the Americans are there, but we won't talk about that. Anyway, we um 
we notice that the other nations are all using capsules, which uh, we think is a little bit wasteful because they're not bringing stuff back, although we've just thrown away a canister of life support, so we won't get into the who's doing the bad things for the environment argument just now. Um, however, we do have a team that was working on our um, white signal. So the team from Avro Canada, wonderful, wonderful chaps uh, from Avro Canada, were originally working on our white signal program and supporting that. Um, they have uh, they, they were approached by the the US actually and um, they, some of them their heads were turned but we we brought them into the fold fully we went no no you can you can you can come from Canada to the wonderful sunny British Isles they they didn't believe us on that I'll be honest with you um, and but they do have an idea for capsules so we're going to have them look at capsules we may use that in addition to the space plane program it may be something that um doesn't go anywhere it may be something that we use for landing on the moon and it's something that just is in a lunar orbit situation we don't know we can't imagine landing a plane on the moon but it would be quite interesting so um so th those guys are going to do some research but i don't think we're going to get anything soon and currently the plane situation seems to be going okay apart from well we <sighs> We asked her to fly it reasonably sanely, but it seems that Jane is a little bit of a crazy flyer and she did a little bit of a spin there. Now she is practicing. We have asked her to practice some of the tighter, sort of harder turns in the upper atmosphere. So she's blaming that for the uncontrollable nature at some points, but um, you can see here, she's, she's doing some really quite tight turns. Um, she is doing well, she's flying wonderfully and we're actually very proud of, of what she's achieving. Um, we don't know if this craft has actually got much of a future though. We're pretty much at its limit right now. We could keep strapping on life support systems over and over and over again. Um, but number one, it's a one person craft and there's only so much you can do with a one person craft. So we need to start looking at going bigger. We have got some additional technology on the horizon. We've continued down our space plane program. But before that, we need money. Um, so how do we get money? Well, we do commercial contracts. So we're going to do another commercial flight so while we're waiting for the moon mission which is being prepared in australia we're setting up another commercial flight again from spirit adam uh, again into a sort of polar orbit and again a weather satellite however this is a second generation uh, satellite um, interestingly we thought at this point that we might have to switch over to our upcoming rocket our uh, red princess 5 but it seems the 4C has still got some legs on it. So it's likely that this, this is going to just keep going. We'll probably uh, phase it out. But, uh, you know, while there's a demand for this sort of launch capability, it seems silly to sort of push something else into the system. It's cheap and we like it. So um, the, the, the Red Princess uh, 4C just comes up into orbit. You've seen this so many times right now. I actually, I'm, I'm trying to speed it up as much as possible. And I want to show you the launches and show you it doing things. But... It just becomes it becomes routine. It is actually just a routine launch now, and we can we can pretty much we could fire one of these off almost every month at the moment. So this is again we're at the 14th of August. We're in August. We've had the the uh, the second flight of the White Javelin 2B, which will probably be its final flight. Actually, we have something else that we're working on, but it will de we're going to debate which one is actually going to be most suitable for its next mission. Um, and and so this. This commercial flight is just slotting in just at the end of that um, as a successful flight um, three days later. Um, it, it pretty much gets overshadowed. In fact, we don't even think it's been mentioned in the newspapers. Um, you know, people are getting more weather news, but that's about it. They don't care about the satellites anymore because it's not grand and amazing. So, you know, but it's done, sorted. Um, and we do need a little bit more money, but we also want to try and develop some other engines and other technologies and we're also concerned about our row engine and it's shall we say its reliability is not the best ever so we want to get some more science we want to do some more science research this is not a paying contract we're actually sending up this is the first of our red princess fives so it has a very similar first stage to the red princess fours the second stage is a little bit beefier it's got uh, a few extra engines on there and it's a little wider. It's a little wider craft. This is a little shorter of a craft. It's more of a lipstick. It's getting towards the lipstick design yet again. Um, um, and so this has got four engines, four of those Spectre engines instead of three, just to give it a bit more whack there. And then its upper stage is a row engine. This is primarily aimed to get us a bit of experience with the row engine and develop it a bit more because we do see that as a, as a future sort of 
pathway for us. The row engine at the moment has a, a, a few relights, but later on we're hoping to add more and then it becomes a much more capable engine for us, particularly um, for some of the, uh, the transfers to other planets and actually around other planets and around the moon would be useful. So this is gonna be into a really high orbit and this is this is actually the satellite it is carrying is UK Ops 1, which is, uh, it's gonna be an infrared spectroscopy satellite and an orbital perturbation satellite. It's gonna try and draw in some long-term science for us. And this is a long-term satellite mission. This is gonna be up there for a long time. We're looking at, you know, a few years, I hopefully, of getting data back from this thing. Um, We've employed the 5A because it allows us to actually get into this orbit and it, it's something that the, the 4C could not do easily. The 5A has the ability to put it into this highly elliptical orbit. We could actually even have used some of its additional fuel to make it a little bit more circularized, but we didn't, decide not to. But what we can do is we can detach and send that stage back down. Now we can change its orbit and, and be fine. So there we go, there's the UK Ops 1 doing its science, Ryan, Ryan while it flies around the the upper atmosphere and sees what's going on. However, while we cut away, we're actually around Mars. That's right, EOS 2A and 2B are arriving at Mars. It is the 8th of November, 1961. You didn't see that coming, did you? That's right, because we just switched straight across. So both of them are out of signal, but they're able to connect data. So all of their systems are on. You can see they're, they're just flying across now and they've got a slight roll on them which is problematic and also not problematic because because they're, they're basically where they are they're just getting enough sunlight but it, it makes sure that there is some sort of sunlight signal there they're able to gather the data when it comes to transmitting it back though we're hoping they're actually going to be closer to the sun so that we can actually you know get a better signal so there we are that's eos 01a just departing mars it's gone around the equatorial route um and here we are with EOS, sorry, 2B, that was EOS 1 or 2A coming in. This is EOS 2B coming in just over the poles. And it's a slightly different angle we're getting here. Of course, we don't get any of this data. We don't know this is actually happening. We, well, we know it's happening. We just don't get anything back because we don't have a signal. Um, it's hoped that the, the EOS uh, 2B will actually fly near the Earth in about a year and, uh, and, and three quarters. Its orbit should bring it within range of the Earth within within you know 18 months is the hope, and the EOS 2A is going to be a little longer. That's going to be about two year, two just over two years we think. But we, we're going to get a lot of data. We've got all of this polar data, all the equatorial data, so we're willing to wait. We, ironically, we may actually get a craft up to Mars before that data comes back. We're not sure. It depends on our transfer windows at the moment. But we do see some wonderful. Well, we will see potentially some wonderful sites. These crafts have got on board. They've got cameras. They've got all of the most up-to-date technology when they were bought. When they were bought. When they were when they were launched. So we will get pictures, hopefully, if one of them can get close enough to Earth, and we will get some data on pressure, temperature, on radiation levels, everything like that. And the hopes is that, that can actually help guide us for for not only sending other craft there, but also in the future maybe landing on the red planet and seeing what it's like down there because, you know, Jules Verne and people like that have, have often made wonderful stories about Mars, but we're starting to, to really get interested in what is actually down there because it's clear there's some sort of atmosphere and it's clear there's some sort of activity, but we don't know what it is. So we need to find out. So, it's the big one, 15th of November, 1961. This is seven days after our craft passed Mars. Um, which we don't know about. And we are launching Celine 1A. Uh, and it's also on our new launch craft. This is the Blue Knight 1A. It's a brand new vehicle we've been developing. It uses um, engines that are quite, well, you've seen them before, but there's a lot of them, shall we say. They're the the uh, the RZ2 engines are, are quite heavily packed on the bottom there, and we have modified them a little bit. We've actually changed them to use peroxide because we like peroxide and and uh, and so forth in our fuels. So peroxide is our oxidizer, and we have uh, kerosene as our fuel there. And then we switch over to this second stage, which has got a bunch, a bunch of Spectre engines, and this is pretty much. It's pretty much the first stage of the uh, the Red Princess uh, 
4C. We've actually just, we've refined it a little bit, but it's basically the same thing. So we've taken that Red Princess's first stage and stuck it on top of our new launch capability. And the idea being we can put a big load into orbit. Now, we're not sure on what our orbital limits are right now with this craft, but we're, we're putting something up there. So there we go. We have our, our lunar craft. This is Selene with its transfer stage. That transfer stage is, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's purpose built for the Selene at the moment, but it is actually gonna be used for some other things as well. We're actually gonna be using that transfer stage for some of our, in, our interplanetary missions and so forth like that. So we're just gonna arrange ourselves, get our, our, ourselves lined up to actually do this transfer. And we wanna come in into a position where we can actually potentially go into orbit. We could go direct descent, we're not sure. We are running a little low on funds. Uh, and so we've needed to offset uh, a lot of the development for this with those commercial flights. Um, the British government doesn't really doesn't wanna pay us to do things anymore. They want us to earn our way. We don't get free funds, shall we say. So this transfer stage is over provisioned for what it's gonna be asked to do because it is actually designed for interplanetary sort of startings and, and, and jumpings and helpings and doings. Um, but it fires off, it sends us towards the moon and then we detach it. And we've basically got our Selene 1 craft flying around there. You can see Selene 1 and it is a two stage program. It's got a it's got a Spectre engine on the back there that we're actually going to, I think it's a Spectre engine, it could be a row engine, I can't remember. That's terrible but it is going to do its heavy braking and then it's got some thrusters that we actually we took from the baloo the baloo actually concept has been sort of adapted um which was concerning for a lot of people but the idea is we're going to come in and we're going to we're going to try and get into a semi-orbital position um prior to landing we want it to, it's going to require the row engine to actually fire multiple times which is why we chose row engines if we'd have not chosen the row, if we'd gone for the Spectre, it would have had to be direct descent. By choosing the row engines, and we can swap them out. We could actually put a, a, a Spectre engine in here and go direct descent. Um, and there was debate over this, but we can basically sit in orbit there and, uh, and make a decision about when we want to come down and where we want to come down. So we bring it around and we're going to come down on the light side. We want uh, the angle of the sun to be somewhere that we can actually see the sur surface shadow, ideally. Obviously, the computer is doing this, not us. And you'll see it's like a very small version of the uh, the Newton bus. It is not a Newton bus, though, that we're using. This is very much a, a, a specific designed stage for this. It cost us a lot of money to prepare this. So we come down and we are coming in and it's basically there is no going back at this point. You know, all the memories of the Baloo one here is, is coming back to us. We've, we, we're getting closer and closer and closer. And the idea is we're gonna get as close as possible before we fire that row engine's final final set of fuel. We wanna fire everything in one go. And there we go. We're firing the RCS and we're about to fire the row engine. There we go. The row is firing. This is take, trying to kill as much of that speed as possible right now. We're coming down in the sunlight. We've released it. It's going to hit. It's gonna be an impactor for us. So we can see that leading. We're firing our little thrusters right now, going down all the way down yeah it here we go it's 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 now or never it's now or never we're just we're just got to balance it out we're just going to balance it out you can see we need to just be going down slowly we've got a bit of thrust we've got a bit of control we've got rcs firing the rcs isn't massively balanced it's not perfect it's not print the ground is definitely not level there is a one so you can't see here there's a significant slope there is a significant slope on this this is going to be tough we're just going to pop it down slow it down slow it down Slow, 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 slow. Don't oh, bunch, but oh, there we go, and down we are. It was, it was a, it was a tricky one, shall we say? So, we are on the moon. We have landed successfully. Um, the craft actually landed um, between the Riccoli and the Grimaldi basins on the lip of Grimaldi H, and that was actually named after an Italian. So we actually sent some pictures back. You can see the camera on the top there to the Italians to uh, to celebrate this wonderful achievement. So while they look at that, while we figure out what the next step is for this, and until next time, have a great one.